We had railway lines which were running in this part of the world. They were efficient. Several years down the line, having collapsed the railway lines, we now have what we are calling SGR. Who has built them? Who has financed them? And how, when will we pay for them? We don't want to ask such questions. They are uncomfortable. But we call them as representing growth, we say. When we cite growth, we talk about them. The question is, is Africa once again being shortchanged? Is it possible that those of us who have had the advantage of education as professionals are conniving and engaging in relationship with other professionals in a manner that is unequal in this continent? Do we ask ourselves whether the South Koreans with whom we can compare ourselves do things the same way as we do? Do we ask ourselves whether in South Korea when they are doing their roads 80% of what is done is done by South Koreans with a little assistance from others? Do we ask ourselves whether the earth-moving equipment that is being used in our roads are made in Africa? Do we ask ourselves what component of our raw material is used? Oh, those are too uncomfortable to ask. We can even go to Vietnam, which all of us know was bombed to the ground as recently as 1975, and see the infrastructure that is coming out in Vietnam. Is the model that they are using the same model that we are using in Africa? When we are told that they are world standards, are they truly world standards or they are designed to exclude us? Because if they were world standards, why is it that the roads that are made in Kinshasa are not the same as the roads that are made in Columbus, Ohio? These are questions that we must begin to ask. They are uncomfortable. But going forward, when we talk about Africa, regaining her position in the world amongst the Committee of Nations in terms of infrastructural growth, we must ask ourselves the foundational questions. Are we doing the right things right? Africa Agenda 2063 promises us, among other things, that by the year 2063 we will have, hopefully, Roads that are running from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, through to Dhaka in Senegal, from Cape Town to Cairo. We are promising ourselves that Kinshasa will be the Silicon Valley of Africa. We are promising ourselves that we will have electric rail trains running from Angola, Luanda to Suakin in Sudan. We are promising ourselves many good things, but the question is, are we prepared? The question is, are we using African expertise for the benefit of Africa? Are African professionals having the time to contribute in an effective manner? You, the engineers who are here, must ask yourself the foundational question, are you really participants in the struggle to grow Africa? Is it possibly the case, is it possibly the case that if an African firm has to have a chance in a competition for some major project, they cannot succeed until and unless they are in collaboration with a Chinese firm or an English firm or an American firm? Is that the reality? And if it is, is it a good thing? These are the uncomfortable questions that we must ask ourselves. Is it the case? that in this day and age, 
If your qualification is to be considered to be a qualification worth its salt, it must be obtained in some country outside of Africa, and that if you have a qualification from within an African university, then you are second guessed by other civilizations. Perhaps you who are present here do not suffer this fate. But what about your children and children's children? Will they have, because none of you holding all factors constant will be around in 2063. And even if you are, you'll be too old to be useful. <laughs> the question is, as we talk about the role of the consulting engineer in Africa, we must ask ourselves the fundamental questions. And to me, the fundamentals is, is that Africa must progressively begin to work as a united bloc. I am aware that FIDIC does great work in the world. FIDIC was founded in 1913. No African country had regained her independence. Except Liberia, they were not there at the founding. When you participate in FIDIC, are you at the dinner table as diners, as I've said before, or as waiters? Because you can be at the dinner table as waiters, or as diners, or as food to be consumed. Where are you? <laughs> so we must have our stake in FIDIC, in international organization, so that when we talk of standardizations, we are participating in real terms, not by mere presence. If we want to be hard as Africans, we must have a united front. The 55 of us, we must work under the aegis of the African Union and our voice must be clear and unequivocal. Because if it is not clear and unequivocal, we will be divided and that is a fact. You know, just last night, I was reading a speech that was delivered by Ghana's Kwame Nukuruma on the 12th day of January 1961 in Casablanca, Morocco. And he was saying, and I agree with him, that Africa has lost out in what Europe defines as the Industrial Revolution. But it is now our duty to ensure that we leapfrog it because we have had the advantage of seeing what they did not do right. It gives us the opportunity of avoiding the landmine that they stepped on. And that Africa will only do so if Africa recognizes the artificiality of their boundaries. So that when we are licensing engineers in Accra in Ghana, that engineer must have the competence to work in Casablanca in Morocco and in Tunis in Tunisia. It is only then that we will be able to compete and compete effectively for the benefit of Africa. And he went on to say that Africa therefore requires a new man and a new woman. A new man and a new woman who recognizes that in the world there is cutthroat competition and throats are actually being cut. And that therefore, as professionals, we must begin to initiate activities that are going to change the lives of our people. And I believe that that is one of the reasons when he went back to Ghana, he started thinking about the Akosombo Dam in Ghana. He then went to Liberia and said, why are we not having factories to make our rubber here? He was asking foundational questions. Fellow engineers or fellow professionals, I'm not an engineer. Africa is at crossroads. The question is, which one do we take? 
Do we take the path of professionalism that learned from other civilizations for the long-term sustainability of the continent, or do we take the path of following other civilizations and marveling at what they do to the detriment of the continent of Africa? When you fly across Africa today, if you fly into Entebbe, the airport is being expanded. I would want to hear that Ugandan consulting engineers are taking 80% of the credit. I would want to know, you will tell me. When I fly into Julius Kambarage International Airport in Dar es Salaam, I see the expansion that is going, to, going on there. I would want to know that the Tanzanian consulting engineer is playing the lion's role there. I would want to hear. When I go to Bole International Airport in Ethiopia, the expansion is going on there. I would want to know that the African engineer is involved there, that the African architect is involved there. When I go to Blestiane Airport in Dhaka in Senegal, I would want not to hear that some French designer designed it. The tragedy is, what I would want to hear is not what I hear. So that the consulting African engineer is in quite a number of countries still consigned to doing some rural roads, rural roads. So that we may commission our football stadia, but they are designed in China and built by Chinese. That is not the path of growth that I would want to hear. I would want to hear another path of growth. Let us learn from the Chinese, but let us learn to do certain things ourselves. This is what Africa must hear. This, in my view, is what Africa must do. This is what other civilizations have done for sustainable development. You ask the Koreans how they did it. Ask the Chinese how they did it. Ask any other civilizations how they, Asians, how they are doing it. They are using expertise from the world, but certain things are ring-fenced for, for their own professional. Do we ring-fence things for ourselves? I'm told we are ring-fencing only 30% in Uganda. Why are we ring-fencing 30%? Let us ring-fence 70%. It can be done because it is a question of cross-fertilization of ideas. We must learn from other civilizations, but learning must not mean surrendering to them. 